So, um, right. So, uh, I think we start from this fairly simple idea that everybody knows how DNA replication works, so why would anybody work on it? Because we already know that it's a template-based copying, uh, which is sort of seen very nicely here in this little diagram um, where each strand serves as a template for a, a new DNA molecule. But I think what often gets lost in these kind of textbook pictures um, is the scale of the whole process. And I think probably most of you are aware of the fact that the human genome is a, is a billion or so base pairs long, two meters per cell. So that's a lot. Um, that sounds like a lot. Uh, what you probably don't think about too much is the fact that you also have a lot of cells in your body. Um, and if you actually calculate how many cells you have in your body and think about the turnover of things like blood cells and skin cells, it turns out that during the course of your life, you're going to synthesize about a light year of DNA. So that's a pretty amazing statistic. And of course, it's done at increments of about three and a half angstrom. So it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty amazing uh, process. And to put it in a little bit more perspective, because a lot of people who aren't geeky Star Wars fans like me don't really think about what light years mean, um, it means that during this talk, each one of you will synthesize about 20 billion meters of DNA. So it's a pretty, you know, so if you think you're wasting your time here, just close your eyes and realize you're doing something very useful. <laughs> um, so, so there's a tremendous amount of DNA synthesis that goes on in your body. And of course, you know that mutations in any of many tumor suppressors and oncogenes can cause cancer. But two thirds of us actually won't get cancer. And although working in a cancer institute, we focus on the one third of people who do get cancer, I think it's a fairly amazing statistic that actually most of us get through our lives without uh, generating the kind of mutations that generate cancer. So in fact, size matters. Here. It's, it's actually quite important. The scale of this whole thing is important. And of course, as, as I kind of just mentioned, um, replication has a really central role in, in cancer biology, really in two different areas. One is in oncogenesis, because although two thirds, of, two thirds of us don't get cancer, a third of people uh, do. Uh, and that is almost always accompanied by some kind of chromosome uh, abnormalities, rearrangements, and, and often high error rates. Uh, and these kinds of translocations that you can see in these various uh, spectral karyotypes really are almost invariably arise during the process of replication and problems that are associated with DNA replication. So understanding how normal cells maintain a normal karyotype is actually important for trying to understand how cancer cells uh, are unable to maintain a normal karyotype. Of course, the other area where DNA replication is incredibly important in cancer biology is in, in therapies and diagnostics. And um, for decades now, um, DNA replication has been targeted by a lot of different kinds of, of drugs. And these are actually often quite effective uh, in, in treating cancers. But uh, most of these things have fairly terrible side effects, um, and they're mutagenic in their own right. And so coming up with second generation drugs that, that uh, target the same kinds of things but without the side effects are actually quite important. So that's a little plug for uh, cancer biology. What I'm really going to do for the remainder of the talk is really talk about the basic biology of, of DNA replication. So um, as I've already mentioned, we have very large genomes. Um, and if we compare our large genomes to um, the well-studied E. coli replication system, uh, there's, there's one really key, key difference to how replication is managed. So in E. coli, uh, the genome is contained on a single chromosome. It's a, it's a big circular chromosome. And replication happens from a single replication origin. And that, that means a lot for the way E. coli regulates replication. In fact, a lot of the control really is, is executed at the level of the origin itself. It has an important implication, uh, and that implication is that um, the length of time that it takes to replicate its genome is directly proportional to the size of the genome. So if E. coli wanted to become a more complicated bacterium, 
uh, and have some more genes, it would take it longer to replicate its genome. So there's a direct payoff there, and that's presumably why genomes have ended up being the size they are. Eukaryotes, a few billion years ago, developed a trick, uh, and the trick was uh, to use multiple replication origins to replicate their genomes. And that has a really important consequence, which is that the length of S phase is now no longer proportional to the size of the genome. So you can have massive genomes. As long as you have enough replication origins, you can still have a relatively short S phase. And one of my favorite examples is uh, early Drosophila embryos, where um, replication of the whole genome happens in about uh, two or three minutes. Uh, and the reason for that is that the origins are spaced about three kilobases apart. And they all fire at the beginning of S phase, and so the whole genome gets replicated incredibly quickly. Of course, in most somatic cells, replication doesn't start synchronously at all replication origins. There's this thing called the temporal program of origin firing. So some origins get fired early, others get late, get activated later, and still others are so late that they don't normally get activated, and we call those dormant replication origins. But the key thing is that at this point, when this late origin is firing, it's absolutely critical that the early origin doesn't refire, because if an, an origin were to reinitiate, uh, then you'd end up with partial reduplication of the genome, which we know from a variety of, of uh, genetic tricks that we can do is very lethal and leads to very high rates of genome rearrangement. So the, uh, the cell goes to an awful lot of trouble to make sure that, um, <clears throat> that each of these origins gets activated exactly once in every cell cycle. Right, so uh, what I'm gonna do now is tell you a little bit about how the whole process is regulated. Uh, but before I really get into that, the, the key enzyme in this whole thing turns out to be the DNA helicase that unwinds the genome. And uh, I'll show you what the eukaryotic version of this is in a minute. We don't yet have a high resolution crystal structure of the eukaryotic uh, replicative helicase. So I've just shown this picture of a, a sort of very distant relative, the papillomavirus E1 protein, which um, has a, a lot of the same features uh, probably as the, as the eukaryotic um, protein. So the first thing is that this is a six subunit helicase. Each one's a different color here. Um, and like most of these six subunit uh, helicases, there's a single strand DNA molecule that passes down the middle of the six subunits and, and in fact, the way it works is by translocating along this uh, single-stranded DNA, displacing uh, the, the, uh, the other strand. Um, and the other feature, uh, which will become important a little bit later, is that um, in this particular group of, of HeLa cases, uh, ATP hydrolysis is actually shared between two adjacent subunits. So one subunit, the ATP is this little blue thing up here. So one of the subunits has the Walker A and Walker B motifs that bind to ATP, and the adjacent subunit donates an arginine residue called an arginine finger that's required for the hydrolysis of ATP. That'll be significant a little bit later. So <clears throat> in eukaryotes, the replicative helicase is uh, what we call MCM2 to 7. Uh, if you're interested, I can tell you why it doesn't start at 1. It's, uh, a typical yeast issue uh, for gene naming, but it's, it's MCM2 to 7. It's a, a hexamer of six subunits, MCM2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. These are all related to each other, and they're related uh, to uh, an archaeal version of this. It's a slightly simplified version. So in many archaea, there's a, a single MCM that can form homohexamers. In a eukaryotes, that's the job's been divided up so that each of the MCMs are, are specialized. And, and actually, that turns out to be important for most of my talk, that, that each of the MCMs really has slightly different functions in replication. And I'll, I'll really spend most of my time today talking about that. But the features that they all have in common are uh, this AAA plus domain here toward the C terminus, which is the, the bit that binds ATP and hydrolyzes it. And then there's an N terminal domain that can form a hexameric ring. Um, 
And this is a picture that I've been showing for a while. It's from Sylvia Nesti uh, a few years back. This is, this is uh, probably still uh, one of the, the nicest structures that we have of the MCM complex. Um, and it's, it's it came from uh, electron microscopy. Uh, and you can see this is the, the archaeal MCM forming a, a hexamer. You can see the six-fold symmetry here. And you can see these two kinds of domains. There's a oh, N-terminal domain here. Yeah, and the C-terminal domain up here. Thanks, Sylvia. I always get that one confused. Yeah, the N-terminus is down here. The C-terminus is up here. Um, but as I mentioned, this is a homohexamer in, in archaea. And in, in um, eukaryotes, there are six genes. Uh, each of the six genes is essential. So if you delete any of them, cells are dead. So they each have a special role in replication. And of course, one simple reason why they're each essential is that they each occupy a unique place in the hexameric ring. Uh, and this is the order of the subunits here, uh, showing where the um, ATP binding and the arginine fingers are from, from each of them. And again, I'll come back to this later. But it turns out this probably isn't the only reason that they're each essential. They're also each essential because they all do slightly different things in replication. And the thing that I'll, I'll really focus on today, the fact that several of the MCMs have long tails on them that aren't present in the uh, archaeal proteins. And the two that have the longest C-terminal tails in eukaryotes are MCM3 and MCM6. And they'll really be uh, quite important in my talk today. OK, <clears throat> so what I want to take you through now is the kind of current view of how replication actually initiates on a kind of molecular level in eukaryotes. Um, and then I'll, I'll specifically talk about one of the steps in replication. <clears throat> so it begins with the binding of this protein called ORC. ORC stands for Origin Recognition Complex. Uh, and I'll say quite a bit more about what work is and what it does later. But what it's really uh, key, f critical for is um, the assembly of a thing called uh, a pre-replicative complex. And the pre-replicative complex is effectively the MCM complex loaded onto DNA. And I'll tell you how that works in a few minutes. But that loading process requires a couple of other essential proteins, CDC6 and CDT1, and it's ATP dependent. I'll, I'll have quite a bit more to say about that in a minute. Uh, this helicase, when it's loaded onto DNA, is inactive. And this is really the party trick that eukaryotes learned a few billion years ago. In E. coli, as soon as the helicase is loaded onto DNA, it starts to unwind DNA. So there's no separation between the loading and the activation. But in eukaryotes, they first load the helicase as an inactive form, and then they activate it. And the activation is still very complicated, and we still don't understand it fully. But I'll take you through what we do understand. So it, the activation of the helicase requires a whole bunch of different proteins. Um, some of them are protein kinases. Some of them are proteins that we really don't understand the biochemical functions of at this <laughs> point. So the first thing that happens is that you need a kinase called DDK, and DDK stands for DBF4-dependent kinase. It's a heterodimer of CDC7, which is the catalytic subunit, and DBF4, which is the regulatory subunit. And DDK phosphorylates the MCM proteins. These are called firing factors. Uh, D DDK phosphorylates the MCM proteins actually on some of those N-terminal tails that I, I didn't really mention that, that uh, many of the MCMs have. Um, and so that, that phosphorylation seems to be probably the first step in the activation. And what that, one of the things, at least, that that phosphorylation is required for is to recruit uh, these proteins, SLD3, SLD7, and CDC45, into, uh, into a complex. Uh, in budding yeast, at least, this can happen way before the helicase gets activated. So this will happen at early origins, early in G1 phase, way before replication begins. Separately, in another part of the nucleus, just for, sort of floating around, uh, there's another complex. And this involves the leading strand DNA polymerase called Pol epsilon, and two other proteins, SLD2 and a heterotetrameric protein called GINs. Um, this plays a key role in initiating replication, but these things have to be brought together. 
And the way that they're brought together is by the second kinase that's required for replication, which is the cyclin-dependent kinase. So what cyclin-dependent kinase does is it phosphorylates SLD2 and SLD3. And in budding yeast, we showed a few years ago that this seems to be the only thing that CDK needs to phosphorylate. So we can make phosphomimicking mutants in these two proteins and bypass the requirement for CDK. And what this phosphorylation actually does is it brings the two proteins together via this adapter called DPB11. DPB11 has multiple BRCT repeats, and BRCT repeats bind to phosphopeptides. And what you end up doing is pulling this complex into the whole thing uh, via SLD2 and SLD3 interaction. It's already at a point here where it's pretty uh, impossible for anyone to really draw this out. So I hope nobody's trying to draw this out in the audience. Um, and we have no evidence that this is any kind of a stable intermediate of any, any kind. But then there's the magic step that somehow leads to triggering the helicase to become activated. And we know that the helicase, when it's activated, translocates along the leading strand template. So it's bound around single-stranded DNA. And um, so one of the things that has to happen during all of this, which I haven't really mentioned because I'm going to come back to it, is that in this inactive form, the MCMs are bound around double-stranded DNA. And so there's a transition that has to happen where the helicase has to somehow reopen, extrude one of the strands, and become bound around the correct strand of DNA. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. Then after replication, you end up going back to uh, this ORC bound structure. And as far as we know, ORC is bound throughout the, uh, the whole cell cycle. Now, I mentioned that this can really uh, only has to be limited to once per cell cycle. And that's done through the action of the cyclin dependent kinase. Because in addition to having this role in promoting initiation, it has a second role in preventing the licensing step. So as soon as CDKs become activated and trigger replication, at the same time, they're preventing the reassembly of a pre-RC at uh, the origin that's just fired. And that, that's how you get once per cell cycle replication. So I quite like this quote. It's been, it's been hijacked by synthetic biology, but I think it really applies very much to biochemistry, uh, which is, came from Richard Feynman. It was apparently on his whiteboard for many years. And it's, what I cannot build, I cannot understand. And so sort of that's sort of a credo for biochemists is to try and build things from the ground up so that we can really understand how they work. And of course, what we need to do that uh, comes from another set of famous people, uh, Arthur Kornberg, uh, Ephraim Racker via Arthur Kornberg. And, and the, the idea here is don't waste clean thinking on dirty enzymes. So it's been our approach now to really try and rebuild replication from the ground up with purified proteins and purified DNA. And the basic assay that you'll see a lot today um, is, is a simple one. Effectively, what we do is we take a magnetic beads, that's what the B is here, and they're attached to, we attach DNA to them via a, a photocleavable biotin uh, streptavidin interaction so that we can cut the DNA off by irradiating with a, a, a near visible wavelength of light so it doesn't do any damage to the DNA or the proteins and we can look at the proteins that are bound. Um, and this slide just shows uh, two of the kind of key sort of reactions that we do a lot. So the first is uh, if we take ORC, CDC6, CDT1, MCM proteins and we put them all together in the presence of ATP, what we end up with is, is ORC and MCMs bound to DNA. And if we take that and we subject it to a high salt wash, so you see on a lot of slides, HSW is high salt wash, uh, then ORC is removed and the MCMs remain on the DNA. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, but we can also do the reactions in the presence of a non-hydrolyzable analog, ATP gamma S. And when we do that, we get a different intermediate that actually has all of the uh, intermediate proteins, CDC6, CDT1, as well as ORC and MCMs. But this presumably is reflecting some early step during the loading process. And the MCMs haven't been, at this point, loaded onto the DNA. And so if we subject this to a high salt wash, then everything comes off. And you'll see lots of examples of what that looks like. So um, this is all published a few years ago. Uh, 
we showed, and it was sort of intimated in that model slide, is that when the MCMs are actually loaded in this pre-RC, they're bound as a double hexamer bound around double-stranded DNA. And um, this just shows a, a couple of class averages from the EM, uh, some other things. I won't go through this. It's all published a few years ago. This is the sort of low-resolution reconstruction of the double hexamer. So the double hexamer is held together by these two N-terminal domains that I, that I showed you at the very beginning that the MCMs have. So this is the orientation of them. And of course, one of the features is they have this channel that passes through the middle of it. And by a variety of approaches, we've argued that uh, this is actually bound around duplex DNA. So first is, uh, you can see this rotary shadowing uh, of the MCM complex, and you can see the DNA passing along the long axis of the DNA. And uh, the other kind of uh, thing that we've done is to show that if we pre-bind the MCMs to DNA um, and then wash everything else off and look at the rate that the MCMs come off the DNA, then they come off linear DNA much faster than they come off circular DNA, uh, which suggests that they're able to slide along the duplex DNA and, and they're topologically kept on circles, but they can slide off the end of the linear. So that's led to this idea that the, uh, the MCM double hexamer is, is bound around double-stranded DNA. And so we're pretty confident that that's what we've made in vitro. One of the things that we've worried a little bit about over the years is whether this is actually a genuine precursor of replication or it's some kind of a biochemical artifact. And that's a tricky one to address. We're trying to do that now. But one of the things that we need to be able to do uh, to, to see if this is a real precursor of replication is to try and put this thing into something and get it to replicate. And that involves needing uh, an in vitro replication system, which really hasn't existed uh, in eukaryotic cells. And so we've actually set one up recently. Um, and what we do here is we've made a yeast strain that overexpresses a whole series of these uh, firing factors that I've already told you about. And <clears throat> It also contains a mutation in that DDK. It's a temperature-sensitive mutation in DDK. So what we do is we arrest cells in G1. Then we induce the expression of all of these things. And then we release them from this alpha factor arrest uh, at the restrictive temperature. So they, they leave G1 and they enter an S phase-like state with high levels of all these fa firing factors. But they can't re really initiate replication because they don't have uh, the DDK that they require, and uh, sorry, yeah, and that's what we effectively make the extract from. And so the idea here is that we take our DNA, either coupled to beads or not coupled to beads, and we assemble uh, the pre-RC onto that with purified proteins. We can then take that complex and phosphorylate it in vitro with purified DDK. And the DDK, I knew this wasn't going to show up. Sorry about this. I, I realized this last night when I was looking at this. You can't really see it, but this is the, the purified DDK. And just makes the point, which I think you can probably see these two bands. You probably can't really see much here. And it's because they're, they're hyperphosphorylated. So DDK ends up being quite heavily autophosphorylated. And we have to dephosphorylate it in order to get it to be fully active. But the idea is that we take that DDK and we phosphorylate the MCMs on DNA, and we then put that into the S phase extract. So we're not putting the DDK into the extract. We're just putting the MCMs into the extract. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I'll skip over that. Uh, it just shows that we recruit all the important proteins. And this just shows that uh, in the app, if we leave out ORC, if we leave out CDC6, if we leave out DDK or DNA, we get only background DNA synthesis. But if we have the complete reaction, we are actually getting uh, origin ORC CDC6 dependent replication in vitro. Uh, so we think this is probably the first evidence that this thing that we've assembled in vitro is actually a precursor for replication. And we're still uh, working on this. So what I want to do now is to, is to really go through how we understand this pre-RC assembly works. Um, and I'm going to show you a model here. And I'm going to then spend the next 10 minutes showing you that the model's wrong. Uh, so don't, don't copy it down. But I, I need to have a starting point here so that we're all uh, 
starting from the same understanding. Um, so the first step in the loading reaction is clearly right. It involves the binding of ORC to DNA. And at the same time ORC binds to DNA, it also binds to ATP. In budding yeast, it actually needs ATP in order to bind DNA. In other species, it doesn't need ATP to bind DNA, but they all ORC from all species seems to be able to bind ATP. Um, and ORC is an interesting protein. It's a six subunit protein, and five of the subunits are members of this AAA plus family of ATPases, which is sort of similar to the MCMs. They all seem to have had some common ancestor at some point back in the distant past. And then there's a sixth subunit that's generated a lot of interest called ORC6, which is completely unrelated to the other ORC subunits and unrelated to pretty much everything else. It's, uh, it's just... Uh, a, a, a sort of, I don't know, orphan protein, but, um, but it's essential for viability. <clears throat> so the next thing that happens is that CDC6 gets recruited to the complex. And this is also pretty well established, and it's pretty clear that in order for CDC6 to be recruited, it needs to be able to bind ATP. And like the five ORC subunits here, CDC6 is also a AAA plus ATPase. So this bit's pretty well established. What happens next uh, is based on work that's been done in yeast extracts. Uh, and it's been argued that the next thing that happens is that the MCMs get recruited to this complex um, via an interaction between CDT1 and ORC6. Um, now, in budding yeast, CDT1 is pretty stably bound to the MCM complex off DNA. So you could see how this might work in recruitment. Um, and it's also been argued that the two hexamers get recruited by two different CDT1 binding sites in ORC6. There's then a kind of a magic step that involves ATP hydrolysis that leads to then the loading of the MCMs onto the DNA. So we've sort of started from this and decided to try and really under try and understand this a bit better with purified proteins. Um, and so the first thing that we needed to do, so I should say in the first paper that we published a few years ago, we showed that the recruitment, that this recruitment here, uh, we, we, which we call recruitment, um, requires ORC and CDC6. So that was pretty clear. Um, but at the time, we didn't look at what the requirement for CDT1 because we purified it as a part of the MCM complex. So the first thing we needed to do was to make CDT1 less MCM 2 to 7. So we expressed the six MCM subunits on their own in yeast, purified them in a strain where the endogenous CDT1 had a tag on it. We could remove it by uh, depleting it from the purified protein. I think the depletion's just shown here. We get rid of CDT1 completely. Uh, the MCM complex forms a nice hexamer on its own. Uh, and we can take then the uh, purified MCM complex from yeast and make some CDT1 and E. coli. We can mix them together, regenerate a, a CDT1 complex, and that complex is, is functional for loading. So you'll see a lot of experiments that look a bit like this, ATP, ATP gamma S, minus and plus high salt wash. So the loaded MCMs are the stuff that happen in ATP after a high salt wash. So that's these MCMs here, which you don't see in ATP gamma S. And this bit here in ATP gamma S in a low salt wash is what we would call the recruited MCM complex. OK, so now we can ask what all the different components are doing, what they're actually required for. So this is an experiment where we're just looking at the recruitment. So it's ATP gamma S and low salt. Um, and we're just asking which proteins, if we leave out individual proteins, what gets recruited? So the first thing to note is that if we don't have ORC, we get nothing. So everything requires ORC. If we don't have CDC6, but we do have ORC, then ORC gets recruited, uh, but then nothing else gets recruited. So this is basically what we'd previously shown. All of the recruitment of MCMs and CDT1 requires ORC and CDC6. The first surprise in this experiment, though, is here. So in this lane, we have ORC, we have CDC6, and we have CDT1. And we see ORC gets recruited. We see CDC6 gets recruited. This is ORC dependent, because it doesn't happen over here. Um, but we don't see any CDT1. So this 
putative interaction between CDT1 and ORC6 is not happening in, in this system. What was even more surprising was that uh, if we left out CDT1, we got recruitment of the MCM proteins to ORC CDC6 in the absence of CDT1. So the MCMs are somehow being recruited uh, by something more direct than via CDT1. And in fact, uh, we only see CDT1 if we have the MCM proteins present. So CDT1 recruitment requires the MCMs and not the other way around. Now, you'll notice that there's more MCM2 in the presence of CDT1 than the absence, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. So the first thing we wanted to do after seeing this, seeing that the MCMs were recruited. Yes? Not loading. So this is low salt ATP gamma S. Um, so the loading absolutely requires CDT1, I should say. So the fact that the MCMs were being recruited in the absence of CDT1 made us think that one or more of the MCMs must somehow being, re being recruited. And so what we did next was to take each of the individual MCMs expressed in E. coli and ask whether they could get recruited. So in each one of these things is three lanes. M just stands for the input MCM. And then PD stands for pull down. So this is DNA with ORC, either without or with CDC6. And uh, I think for some of them, it's quite clear. So for example, if you look at MCM6, this is MCM6 up here. And there's absolutely no MCM6 being pulled down, uh, either the absence or the presence of, um, of CDC6. And if you go through, you see that that's true for each of the individual MCMs. Unfortunately, the one exception to that is the one that happens to run almost at the same. I should have said that this band here is ORC1, which we see in the recruitment. So we use that as a kind of internal loading control. Um, the, one, the one protein that was uh, slightly complicated is, is MCM3, which happens to be at a molecular weight that's quite close to ORC1. But I think you can probably see that that's a doublet there. In fact, if I blow it up, you can see it even better. Um, so this is MCM3 by immunoblot. So it's being recruited to ORC in the absence of the other five MCM proteins. So MCM3 by itself can be recruited in a CDC6-dependent way. And that's just shown here as well. Uh, this is just an experiment where we're looking at MCM3 recruitment. But what this experiment also shows is that we've assembled a variety of different MCM subcomplexes. And the really important one is this one here. So this is MCM2 to 7 lacking MCM3. So it has the other five MCMs, but it doesn't have MCM3. Uh, and we see absolutely no recruitment in this case. So it seems that MCM3 is the key subunit for getting the MCMs recruited to or. Six. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, MCM3 is one of those MCMs that has a long C-terminal tail. We were interested in what, whether that had anything to do with it. Um, and so we did a variety of things, but I'll just show a couple of the sort of preliminary things that made us realize that the C-terminus was critical. One of them we did by accident, and uh, as is often the case, uh, we were actually working out different ways of trying to purify the MCM complex. And one of the things that we tried was to put a, a flag tag at the C terminus of MCM3 and to purify it. And we purified it. It was a beautiful heptameric complex with, with CDT1. It had everything it needed to do. But this is what it did in a, a recruitment assay. It was completely and totally dead. So just putting a tag on the C terminus uh, completely killed its function, which was the first thing that led us to thinking about the C terminus. So then we made this thing by itself in the absence of the rest of the MCMs, and it gets recruited in a, in a way that's dependent on both ORC and CDC6. So the C terminus of MCM3 is, is the key thing here. And so if we look at the, that C terminus, <clears throat> it turns out that most of it is pretty poorly conserved between species. But at the very end of the protein is a little domain that's pretty highly conserved. And the one thing that really drew our attention was this hydrophobic residue at the very C terminus of the protein, because that's really highly conserved. And I should say, even the archaeal uh, MCMs have a hydrophobic residue at the very C terminus, uh, which appears to be conserved. And because we knew that a tag at the C terminus was interfering with the function. It made us think that perhaps this would be important. So we made a set of mutants 
uh, in various different combinations. Most of them aren't really relevant for this talk today. The key ones really are this allele called 3-11 in which we've just mutated this single hydrophobic residue to an arginine. We've also, this one, dash 12, is, a, is another conserved hydrophobic residue that we mutated to arginine. And then 13 is a double mutant. So those are the key, key ones to keep in mind. Um, we took each one of those proteins and assembled them into MCM CDT1 complexes and purified them. They all make nice heptameric complexes. These are just the peak fractions from uh, gel filtration at the 670 marker. So they all make nice uh, complexes. And then we could take each of these complexes and ask what they did uh, in a recruitment assay. And really, the key things are shown here. So just first of all, to orient you, in ATP gamma S, this is the recruitment of the wild type complex. So all six MCMs get recruited. And this ORC1 band uh, is present in all of the lanes. Uh, if we delete the C terminus of MCM3, then we completely lose the recruitment. So the only thing that's left is, is ORC1. And similarly, if we look at any one of those three mutants, the, either, either of the single point mutations or the double point mutant, we completely lose recruitment. I want to stress in this experiment, what we're doing is we have the total complete set of proteins. So there's all six MCMs, CDT1, ORC, and CDC6, but we're getting no recruitment. So I think this is really the strongest evidence that CDT1 can't recruit the MCM proteins to DNA. That it really is all down to MCM3 and the C-terminus of MCM3. Uh, and then I guess not surprisingly, if we look in the presence of ATP in the high salt wash, uh, this is the wild type the complex being loaded, uh, the C-terminal mutant can't load, and similarly, um, this single point mutation just in that very last amino acid is completely dead. Um, I think I'll skip over this. This just shows that if we do the same experiment just with the individual MCM3, we get the same result. So does this actually fit with anything in vivo? So what we can do is we can go back and ask whether any of these mutants can complement the loss of MCM3 function in vivo. And to do that, we use a temperature-sensitive Degron mutant that we set up uh, a number of years ago. So this strain, uh, it's just got a cassette at the, C, uh, at the end terminus of the, of the wild type protein. So at 25 degrees, it grows. At 37 degrees, it grows poorly. It grows a little bit, this particular one, but it doesn't grow very well. And if we put the wild type MCM3 back into that, then we, we suppress the growth defect. But if we put any one of these point mutants back in, uh, we don't see any suppression of the growth defect. So these are all non-functional proteins in vivo. What's kind of interesting is if we look at the, when these things are being expressed, but at the permissive temperature, you can see that the degron's actually uh, viable. But when we overexpress these proteins, it's lethal. So they're actually having a dominant negative effect on growth. So, this argues that the initial interaction between the MCM complex and ORC CDC6 is happening via the C terminus of MCM3 and not via CDT1 ORC6 interaction. Um, but uh, it's still possible that the first hexamer uh, is, is being recruited via MCM3, but that the second hexamer is being recruited by a different mechanism that might involve CDT1 and ORC6. So we probably haven't fully addressed this issue yet, but I'll just show you one experiment where we've made two different complexes uh, that both have wild type MCM2, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Um, and we've got MCM3 either with a, a flag tag at the N terminus now, not the C terminus shown here, so that's functional, or an MBP tag at the N terminus. And both of these are functional. They can both be loaded uh, and recruited pretty normally. And so what we did next was to take this MBP fusion and engineer that MCM3-11 mutant, so the non-functional mutant, into that. And we can then mix these things together in different ratios. And if you only need MCM3 for the recruitment of the first hexamer, then you'd imagine that the presence of the wild-type hexamer would fulfill that function. And then you'd be able to recruit the mutant MCM3 via this second mechanism, which I'm postulating. 
Uh, and the answer is that no matter what we do, in lots of different combinations, we never see anything above background levels of recruitment of the MBP fusion. Uh, we still have other experiments and controls to do with this. It's not a perfect experiment yet, but we think this really is arguing that both of the hexamers probably need to interact. The MCM3 from both hexamers needs to interact with ORC CDC6, which has some interesting implications for how many ORC CDC6s there might be in the loading complex. Okay, so everything I've told you so far suggests that the very first thing that happens when the MCMs get recruited is that MCM3 interacts with ORC uh, CDC6. All of the available evidence, which isn't a whole lot, has suggested, people have made models that the hydrolysis of ATP is something that happens very late in the loading process. So if that were true, then you'd probably guess that if we just use MCM3 by itself without anything else, and we look at the recruitment to, to ORC CDC6, that the recruitment would be very similar in ATP gamma S and ATP, because if ATP hydrolysis isn't happening, then the two things should behave pretty similarly. But in fact, that's not the case. And what we see is very striking, you can see it by both silver staining and immunoblotting, is that we get much more recruitment in ATP gamma S than we see in ATP. And this was sort of the first clue that there was something interesting going on here and that the binding of MCM3 might be doing something to ORC and CDC6. Specifically, it might be triggering ATP hydrolysis. And it turns out that's exactly what happens. So I'll take you through this slide in a little bit of detail. So we're just measuring ATPase activity here in the presence of an excess of DNA. Um, and this just shows that the uh, MCM3 protein made in E. coli or the MCM3-13 mutant, which is just a double mutant in those two hydrophobic residues, don't have any ATPase activity on their own. OC stands for ORC and CDC6. So ORC and CDC6 have some ATPase activity on their own. We don't know whether this is ATPase from, so we know that when ORC binds to DNA, it suppresses its ATPase activity. We've tried to do this in the presence of an excess of, a, of DNA to get as much work bound to the DNA as possible, but we don't know uh, whether this residual uh, ATPase is due to free ORC that's not bound to ATP or to, uh, that's not bound to DNA or to um, uh, some residual basal level of, of ATPase activity in the ORC CDC6 complex. But regardless, what you can see is that when we add the uh, wild type MCM3, we get a big spike in ATPase activity and we don't see that with the mutant protein. Now you might say the MCM proteins are ATPases on their own, but of course this doesn't have ATPase activity here and because of what I said at the beginning that these mutants all have uh, shared ATPase with adjacent subunits, you wouldn't predict that an individual subunit would have ATPase activity on its own. But to just be absolutely sure, what we're looking at is ORC and CDC6 dependent ATPase. Uh, we took that little C-terminal fragment from MCM3 that was sufficient to get recruited, uh, and it turns out that that's also sufficient to stimulate the ATPase of ORC and CDC6. So this really says the ATPase is coming from ORC and ORC CDC6. So that now, gives us a, a completely different way of thinking about this. So what we're thinking is going on here is that ORC and CDC6 bind to DNA. That's sufficient to recruit MCM3, but that then triggers ATP hydrolysis, and the ATP hydrolysis is coupled to the release of MCM3. So we have continued cycles of this happening. I should point out that these reactions contain about two, two picomoles of ORC and CDC6. Uh, but we're getting about 150 or so picomoles of ATP hydrolysis by adding MCM3. So uh, it's not just a single round of ATP hydrolysis that's happening, but there must be multiple cycles of, of MCM3 binding, hydrolysis, and release. And so we think that what this then is reflected in is a steady state lower level of MCM3 being recruited in the presence of ATP. And of course, if you put ATP gamma S in, then you block this ATP hydrolysis step and you freeze everything in this recruited uh, complex. Okay, so this could explain a lot of stuff. It could explain why other labs have thought that CDT1 might be required for uh, recruitment, which I'm gonna come back to in a minute. 
But I wanted to just go back to one of the first things I showed you, which is that in the presence of CDT1, we get more MCM2 recruited, uh, but we don't get more MCM7 recruited. So we wanted to look at that in a little bit more detail. And so we made, we took our complex plus and minus CDT1, and we looked at which subunits get recruited in the presence of CDT1 and which in the absence of CDT1. Uh, and that is shown here. Um, so we've done this by both silver staining and uh, immunoblotting. And I think what you can see is that if you have CDT1 present, you see very nice recruitment of MCM6 that's completely lost in the absence of CDT1. You can go down the line, you can see that the same thing's true for MCM2. So MCM2 is completely absent in the absence of CDT1. Uh, and it's a little less clear because it's a slightly fuzzy band here, but MCM4 is also lost. However, MCM3 uh, is, is recruited efficiently in the absence of CDT1, as is MCM5 and MCM7. And that's effectively exactly what you see by immunoblotting as well. So what on earth does that mean? Well, if you go back to look at the order of the MCMs in the ring, it makes a lot of sense because the ones that get recruited are MCM3, 5, and 7. So MCM3 is being recruited by itself and presumably bringing along 7 and 5 because it's its nearest neighbors. However, what this implies is that when the MCM complex gets recruited to uh, ORC CDC6 in the absence of CDT1, the complex becomes destabilized and, and these three subunits get specifically lost. Okay, so that suggests that CDT1 is doing something uh, to the complex, to the MCM complex. Um, we still don't really know what this is doing, but we've we know a little bit about how CDT1 uh, interacts with the MCM complex. So firstly, it turns out there's a single CDT1 associated with MCM, the MCM hexamer, and uh, this is just one experiment that shows that. What we've done here is to take the MCM hexamer and mix two different versions of CDT1, either a his tag or a flag tag version together in different ratios. So we can have quite a lot of the flag tag uh, CDT1, for example, here. But when we pull out the his tag CDT1, we never see any flag tag CDT1. So um, that argues that there's just a single CDT1 uh, in this complex. Uh, and I think in the interest of time, I'll skip over a lot of this interaction stuff. We found that uh, CDT1 can interact with MCM2 and MCM6 individually. Uh, and similarly to uh, the MCM3 story, it turns out that the strongest interaction between uh, CDT1 and MCM6 is via this C-terminal tail. And I'll just show you this one experiment here, just showing that we can uh, almost stoichiometrically pull down uh, CDT1 with a, a C-terminal uh, MVP fusion. So there's a very tight interaction between the MCM6 tail and CDT1. So I'll skip over that. So then the, the other approach that we've used to look at what CDT1 interacts with in the ring is to use this nonspecific uh, cross-linking reagent <laughs> in the following experiment. So we take the complex with CDT1, and we cross-link it under limiting conditions so that we're mostly getting binary pairs of cross-link. We denature that with SDS and pull out the flag-tagged CDT1 and ask what proteins are associated with uh, that flag-tagged CDT1. So this is what the cross-linking looks like. The MCMs are run off the bottom of this gel. These are the cross-linked intermediates. Uh, and this is what it looks like at the end of the experiment. So if we, if we now take those partially cross-linked things, boil them, and pull out CDT1 specifically, which you can see down here, uh, we get some background of the MCM proteins uh, uncross-linked. And then we get these very four bands, really, for these pairwise combinations and some higher level things that happen only at higher concentrations of the crosslinker. Um, and we've used mass spec and immunoblotting to show that these four bands effectively correspond to MCM2, 4, and 6. So uh, CDT1 is interacting with MCM2, 4, and 6. And if you remember, MCM3 is interacting with ORC and CDC6. So somehow, CDT1 by binding to these three things is, is keeping them stable in this recruited complex. Um, sorry, yeah, so that's pretty much where we were before. Um, the other thing to say about this, though, before I go on, is that 
this is what I've already shown you, that in the presence of ATP gamma S, you lose MCM6, MCM2, and MCM4. Uh, but you do retain these other three MCMs. But if you now look at what happens in the presence of ATP, they're all completely gone. Uh, so that's consistent with this idea that ATP hydrolysis is leading to the release of MCM3 along with 5 and 7. Okay, so how is CDT1 keeping MCM2, 4, and 6 in the ring? Well, there's sort of two models that you could imagine. One is that by interacting with 2, 4, and 6, it's somehow stabilizing the complex so that um, the complex isn't being released. But an alternative model is that um, CDT1, by virtue of this supposed interaction with ORC6, is leading to the recruitment of these three subunits to ORC6. So if this were true, then you'd predict that ORC6 would also be required for MCM2, 4, and 6 recruitment. And so we tested that by making a version of ORC that lacks ORC6. So ORC6 turns out to be the only subunit that's not required for DNA binding, which is convenient. So we could make ORC without ORC6, and we can do the recruitment assay uh, in the presence of ATP gamma S. And what you can see here is that uh, if you go down these two lanes, the only difference in the bands is the absence of ORC6 in the ORC6 delta. So all six of the MCMs are recruited equally efficiently uh, under these conditions. And that recruitment is completely dependent on the C terminus of MCM3, because if we look in that uh, MCM3-11, we lose that. And what's really striking is that if now we look at what happens in the presence of ATP, uh, you can see that when you have all of the subunits, you get uh, MCMs recruited normally, um, and in fact, these are loaded if we do the high salt wash, which I won't show you. But in the absence of ORC6, what happens is that all of the subunits are lost. I think I'll skip over that in the interest of time. And then finally, um, it turns out that um, ORC is a target for preventing re-replication as well. So ORC gets phosphorylated by CDKs, and as I told you at the very beginning, CDK phosphorylation, CDKs play a role in preventing inappropriate licensing. So as soon as CDKs get activated, they trigger initiation from origins that already have loaded MCMs, but they also prevent the reloading of the MCMs. And one of the ways they do it is by phosphorylating ORC. And we didn't really know how that worked, but it turns out that that's working via a very similar thing to what happens in the absence of, of ORC6. So uh, what we've done here is we've taken ORC, and we've, uh, this is unphosphorylated ORC, and this has been in vitro phosphorylated with CDK and repurified. You can see that ORC6, for example, shifts up uh, in this because it's, it's one of the main targets in the complex. Um, and what this experiment basically shows, I think there's some things here. If we look at the loading of, of, of MCMs, which is the high salt resistant version in ATP, then the uh, unphosphorylated ORC works pretty well, but the phosphorylated ORC is completely defective in loading the MCM complex. However, it seems to be completely normal for the recruitment of the MCM complex. So if we compare uh, ATP gamma as low salt, with the two forms of ORC, they're, they're pretty much identical. However, again, if we look at what happens in ATP, what we see is that uh, the MCMs are completely lost from, from the complex. So what we think this means, uh, uh, that's just a control, is the following. So we think that this is what's going on. So that ORC is binding to DNA as before, as is CDC6. And then what happens is that the MCM complex is being recruited not via uh, CDT1, but via uh, MCM3 interaction with ORC CDC6. And that's leading to uh, a conformational change, and we know that um, in the case of most of these AAA plus ATP aces, what happens is there's a major con conformational changes that are required to bring the arginine finger in contact with the ATP binding site of the adjacent subunit. So I've drawn this as sort of a, a conformational change here. And we think this is pretty much the state that we see in ATP gamma S. But then one of two things can happen with ATP hydrolysis. Either you get licensing, that is you get loading of the MCMs onto DNA, or you get what's effectively a kinetic proofreading so that the MCMs are released from the uh, complex coupled to ATP hydrolysis, which presumably makes the whole thing irreversible, uh, 
uh, so that they can then have another go at trying it again. And this clearly plays a role in preventing re-replication because it, it's what the CDK phosphorylated ORC does. And I should just mention a couple of things about mammalian cells. So the first thing you might uh, wonder is you know, why you might need a proofreading thing when there's only three components. But in fact, there's more than three components because it turns out that um, in metazones, ORC is not actually a stable complex, but there's several different subcomplexes that all need to be brought together uh, to do this. And CDT1 is not a stable complex with the MCM protein. So in fact, in metazones, you probably need to bring half a dozen or so different things together. And what we'd argue is that if you're missing any of them, that rather than sit around as some kind of a dead-end complex, it makes sense to uh, release the whole thing and try again. The other thing that we think is interesting about this is that the whole block to re-replication is quite different in metazoans, and there's totally different targets. But one of the targets, one of the key targets in mammalian cells is CDT1. So CDT1 is degraded in, in mammalian cells during S phase. And as I've shown you, if you don't have CDT1, you also get this proofreading thing that it leads to the release of the bound MCMs. So I think this has been kind of a big step forward in terms of understanding the mechanism of this licensing reaction. And uh, as you'll probably see here, I've drawn this all as the loading of a single hexamer. But in fact, we know that in vitro, the double hexamer is loaded in some kind of a concerted uh, way uh, so that we never see single hexamers actually loaded on DNA. It's some kind of a cooperative interaction. So we don't know much about how that second hexamer gets loaded. But uh, I just thought, but one of the things that I have shown you is that somehow both of the hexamers need to interact with ORC via the MCM3C terminus. and so. We've been thinking about how that might work, and these are just sort of the three possible mechanisms that we can imagine this working by. The first is that you have a single ORC CDC6 complex. It loads the first one, and it loads the second one sequentially. We don't like this because we think it's a concerted loading reaction, um, and it also involves sort of quite a complicated bit of acrobatics here to load the second hexamer because it needs to turn it in the other orientation. So the two models that we, we like a bit better than that are this one. So firstly, perhaps there are actually two ORC CDC6s that each load a hexamer uh, in opposite orientations. Uh, and then what we sort of prefer at the moment is a kind of a three-dimensional version of this because you need to have some way that these two things can talk to each other. So we quite like the idea that perhaps there's some kind of a DNA loop involved with a single ORC. CDC, perhaps two CDC6s that then load the MCMs into some kind of a loop. So this is sort of, we think we understand this now a little bit better than we did before. And what I'm going to just end on is a, a fairly recent set of results that have sort of made us think that there's a lot more to this that we really don't yet understand. Um, and we, we started these experiments really um, not because we were interested, not, not to look at loading, but we were interested in some of the downstream steps. And so we thought that if we made some mutants in some MCM ATPA subunits, that we might be able to trap an early intermediate in the melting reaction that happens downstream during the activation. But it turns out we got a slightly uh, unexpected result from all of this. And um, I won't go through this in detail. What we've basically done is made about 35 different mutants in various different uh, Walker A, Walker B, and arginine fingers in the various different MCMs and put them all into these Degron backgrounds to ask which, what the phenotypes were. And you can see that uh, some of the mutants, for example, this MCM7 presensor 1 hairpin mutant, seems to go through S phase pretty normally. It's a little bit slow. Uh, but some of the mutants actually have pretty tight G1S arrests. And so we've taken all of the mutants that give us a tight G1S arrest, and we've um, assembled them all into, again, these heptameric complexes. And the idea was we were going to load them onto DNA and then put them into the S phase extract and see what happens. And that, of course, implies that we can load them onto the DNA in the first place. Uh, and that turned out to not be true. So First thing is to just say that these things all make nice heptameric complexes. They all behave perfectly well, stable complexes on gel filtration. Uh, 
And if we look at uh, what these do in, um, in a recruitment assay, then it turns out that, like the wild type here, they're all perfectly fine for recruitment. They all get recruited in the presence of ATP gamma S, and they're all washed off with high salt, which is what we would expect for normal recruitment. The surprise came when we started to look at the ability of these things to be loaded, uh, because it turns out the wild type, so here again is the same idea, uh, low salt, high salt. Wild type gets recruited, uh, and it gets loaded, so if we do the high salt extraction, we lose all the ORC subunits, but the MCMs remain behind. Um, but it turns out that many of the mutants turn out to have quite uh, severe defects in loading. And uh, so some of them, uh, for example, this one, really look just like we would, we would have seen in the absence of ORC6 or CDT1. That is, they get recruited normally in ATP gamma S, but in the presence of ATP, there's no loading, and the recruited subunits all get released. And others sort of have a sort of an intermediate phenotype where they get, they get recruited a little bit. But uh, I sort of just put this up here to just make the point that there's still a lot more to try and understand. We really don't have any way of accommodating why we might, might need ATP binding or hydrolysis during the loading. So to just summarize what I've, I've tried to tell you today, uh, so we think that the MCM complex that we load is in vitro is really a genuine precursor of replication because we think we can activate it uh, in vitro. Uh, and then the way that MCM 2 to 7 gets recruited is via MCM 3, and this triggers the ATPase activity of, of ORC CDC6, and we don't know which of ORC or CDC6 is really hydrolyzing ATP under these conditions. That's something we're working on. Um, and the ATP hydrolysis is required to load the MCMs, but, but it also promotes the release of incomplete complexes. And we think that this kinetic proofreading mechanism uh, also plays a role in preventing re-replication, as I've tried to argue. And finally, uh, it turns out MCM 2 to 7 ATPase mutants also have defects in li licensing, and that's something we are trying to understand. So um, all of this stuff I've told you today has been done by three people. Uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Ahn is a PhD student who's set up the in vitro replication system and has been looking at the activation of the, the hexamer uh, in vitro. Uh, Jordi has really done all of the work, uh, the bulk of the work I told you about today, which involves this uh, ATP hydrolysis dependent release of the MCM complex when you don't have a complete complex. And finally, uh, Gidon has done this work on uh, this last thing I showed you on the MCM two to seven ATPases. We've had a, a great collaboration over the years with the, an EM group at the ICR in London, and we've been funded by lots of different organizations, in particular Cancer Research UK and the European Research Council. And I'll stop there and take questions. Thanks.